for All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to our OPDA board meeting, November 17th at 4.15. Um, let's start with a silent roll call of our board. All right, so before we begin, we are uh, recording this event, so I just want to let everyone know there's a reason why we're not wearing our face masks. This is a fully vaccinated facility. Everyone has shown proof that they have been fully vaccinated if they're not wearing a mask. Um, all right, so um, board and ex officio member comments. Is there any comments? Okay, so uh, uh, next we have approval of our agenda. I'll approve. Motion made by Wes. Second. Seconded by Kirsten. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Agenda is approved on to our minutes from October 22nd. Have we all had an opportunity to review those minutes, Joe? All right, so motion made by Joe. Do we have a second? Oh, second? Seconded by Kirsten. <laughs> I was thinking somebody might tell me to do it. <laughs> all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Um, next, we have public invited to be heard. Is there anybody here from the public that would like to speak? Okay, um, seeing none. Um, next we have incentives. It looks like we have someone here with uh, landline donuts that would like to address the LTV. Yes. Yeah. Jody is here. If you all remember, uh, Jody came to public invited to be heard a while back. I she did. She was looking at purchasing <laughs> the building, which she yes. has since purchased right across the street. If mm -hmm. you want to take a look. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and have Delray tee up the incentives. And uh, then we'll turn it over to Joey. All right, real quick, she submitted applications for three different grants, uh, being the facade dip grant, um, the retail conversion grant, and the residential grant. And she is asking for the maximum for each. So facade would be 10,000, retail conversion would be 15,000 for the LDDA portion, and LEDP has already approved their 7,500 match. Um, and then the residential would be 5,000. And I'll let her go over the costs associated with each, each of those and then just the whole thing done in general. But the ask all combined to be $30,000 for all three grants. And I just want to follow up with the cost of the reimbursable expenses is two hundred and nine, but the cost of the entire project is $700,000. She'll be investing in the buildings. Right. Um, just go ahead and talk a little bit about your project. That's great. Great. So as um, most of you probably know, we're, we bought the oldest brick building <laughs> in downtown Longmont, and um, we're really excited about it. Um, it's, it's a beautiful space. The Shallerts, who were there before, were very gracious and um, helped us a lot and have kind of taught us the history, and we're very into the history of the building. So um, we've embraced that. We have no desire to like go in and make it look like a disco or you know something strange. We want to keep as much raw the way it is as we can. We're kind of relying on the um, on Boulder Health Department to allow us to not cover everything <laughs> because we are putting in a commercial kitchen and. Um, we're going to serve potato donuts. We make them from scratch by hand. Um, they're a very labor intensive uh, product and we've been selling for three years at farmers markets and pop-ups. We've mostly been like Broomfield down to Denver. So we have a pretty big following and we're hoping they'll come here. So, um, so we're really excited about being part of the community and bringing people up here. We're going to have um, Ozo coffee. Um, and soft serve, which will be really different and like you've never seen before. So we're excited about it. Um, we wanted to open January and we've got pushed to March for now. Um, our timeline keeps changing, you know, just depends on um, builders and supplies and all of that right now. So. Sounds like that to offer that to Dolan. Dolan, yes. yes. I found that way <laughs> a few of you. Yeah. Um, uh, but just a few things to explain as well. Much of what we would be funding is all of the fire suppression, the water line, and the hood. Uh, when this was originally built out as residential um, for the um, top at the final 
hour, it was realized that it did need a sprinkler system when they thought that, that it didn't. So to be able to change it to residential, and it's going to be a lift work trip, mm -hmm. um, uh, they did need to add that sprinkler system to the second floor in that particular building. So that's why you're seeing that. Um, and then the fire suppression, and that's just a lot of money. It's, it's a big expense. It was a big factor in whether we moved ahead with the project at all there. Um, but we decided that it would be worth it. It's just going to cost a lot, and and it's going to be tricky <laughs> getting a sprinkler system in such an old building. Mm -hmm. um, and I will, this last thing I will add is I've never seen a pop-up that you've had yet that hasn't sold out pretty quickly. <laughs> so that's a really good sign. Too. Yeah. Did you guys sell out Sunday? We left at 1.30. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're supposed to go till 4. Yeah, yeah. I know. People came after and they're like, where are you? I'm like, oh, sorry, we're gone. Yeah. So we'll be here. Next one will be for Small, small Business Saturday. Yeah. All right. Do we have any questions from the board? Comments? Um, bum, you decided against the disco. <laughs> disco. We don't have one. Yeah. Disco maybe maybe a, a disco ball. Yeah. <laughs> could show up somewhere. <laughs> Welcome. To the Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, the obvious question is, can you maybe expand on um, the, the impact that your business will provide to our downtown in regards to um, revenue and job creation? Mm -hmm. um, we... Uh, this is our first business, so we're like, um, and the feeling that I'm getting, and this is just, I, is I'm not, I'm not afraid of failing. I'm not afraid no one's going to come. I'm actually a little bit afraid that it's going to be so popular that we won't be able to keep up. So, you know, we're like, six people, are we going to hire six? Six to ten is what we're guessing. Um, but demand, it just kind of depends on demand and what we see happening. Um, we are going to be open times that other things are not. So that would either be, come on, open with us. <laughs> like, come on, let's be open together. Or, you know, we're just, we'll benefit from being open when other things aren't. Um, like I think MA's is closed Sunday, Monday. Um, we're going to be open both those days. So um, our days off, we're planning on during the week, like Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because weekends are big yeah. for donuts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people just want to get the kids and go out and do that on a Saturday or Sunday morning. So, um, we, so we just hope to bring a lot of people um, here and... Um, and we're hoping that other businesses, too, we know a lot, because we've been in markets, we know a lot of entrepreneurs, um, we've taken a lot of classes with, through the SPDC, just like, look, there's space, this, this is where you could come and, you know, be a part of what's happening. Um, whenever we tell people that we're opening in Longmont, they're like, oh, I love what's happening there. You know, they like the restaurants that are opening and um, just different things that are happening up here. Um, we love the community. We love all the parades and just the art festivals, things that get people out. And it feels like a community that really wants to participate in all those things. And we just hope to be a part of it and kind of um, be a place where people can build memories, where they can celebrate um, milestones with their family. And so, and just kind of like become, uh, we, want to f we want to be a place where it feels like we've always been here. And you know, like what it wouldn't be the same with us. Awesome. One of the things that you did mention was that you'll be able to watch them make the donuts. Oh yeah. Kind of an mm -hmm. early kitchen, which oh. is also a really another cool, I think, experiential yeah. aspect. So I mm -hmm. think that'll be a big thing. Yes. But yeah. it sounds like you you potentially have a draw from other communities because you have a following yes. down south. So mm -hmm. that's yeah, we have a loyal following that will definitely come up here. And you know, how often would that be? I don't know. I mean, yeah, once a month, once, you know, whatever they might, what, but we have a way, you know, we have we have those contacts to reach out to and let them know, hey, there's a parade up here or whatever that's happening up here that people might think, oh, okay, I'll go up for that event. So, 
And there are a lot of people that consider themselves donut connoisseurs. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people think they know a lot about, and so they want to come try us, you know? <laughs> so we're excited about that. Awesome. We have four submissions. Yes. So Jody is seeking three separate grants for a total of 30,000, mm -hmm. um, 5,000 residential, 10,000 for gift grant, and 15,000 retail. Um, any further comments, questions for Jody? We have a motion. Um, so moved by John, we have a second. Second. Second by Joe um, to approve 30,000 max in grant. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> All right. Motion carries. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I know where the first donut is, right? My kids are going to be excited. In Greece. In Greece. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> and Jody, you are more than welcome to stay, but not off. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, on to new business. So we have the tactical management assessment report presentation. It sounds tough, by the way. Yeah. It's tactical. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, and if you want to flip that light right there, David, so you can yeah. turn it blank here. Yeah, just uh, as you all know, we invested in uh, this tech so yet open the step. And then hit the button out on the, the blue button on top of the light. Maybe that's what it's going to look like. Um, uh, as you know, we invested with the LEDP just this year as well um, in this technical management assessment to really look at things in the development pipeline to look at projects that have been abandoned and figure out why and come up with some solutions that we can or some recommendations. They can also look at other communities to kind of see their best practices as well. Um, so I will turn it over to him. I open the front. Yeah. Oh. Ah. All right. Oop. Yeah, can you just leave it like that? Just, just like that? that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Looks pretty. Talk to you. Turn that light off right now. Here you go. Okay. There you go. Okay. That's thanks. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Sarn with the So, um, as Kimberly mentioned, um, really the goal was, it was four, four major tasks. And one was to do a deeper dive to really kind of get a better idea of why projects, development projects, have been abandoned in Lama in the past couple of years. Um, really try to quantify um, how much the city may have lost in revenue and investment in terms of jobs. Um, and housing units, and then um, really try to understand um, are there any issues, what's going on to help inform you know, opportunities to make it better and to improve the process. The other part was to uh, tackle a, what I call a comparative analysis of Longmont's entitlement process. And when I say entitlement, basically it's if you're a developer, a property owner, a business, and you want to build something, you have to go through the city, you get approvals. So the process of receiving that approval, which permits you to build, is what we call the entitlement process. Um, for a downtown multifamily project, um, which we use the Spoko and Coffin, um, compared to another downtown multifamily project, which we use uh, Patina Flex in Dublin. And then also to compare a commercial project, and this was an industrial flex project, uh, Don Macy's project, uh, 1660, 1660 Fordham, um, over in the Southwest, and we compared that to a industrial project or flex space that's under construction at CTC and Louisville, Colorado Tech Center. Really to identify what are similarities, what are differences, what, how does Longmont do it compared to someplace else, to see if there's some opportunities, uh, again, for Longmont to, to strengthen the process and partnership between the public and private sector. We also convened two strategy sessions, one was with the development community, and this is a virtual session, um, and the second one was with um, professional consultants and other service industries that basically um, process site plan applications on behalf of developers because they're the ones in the weeds doing the um, 
process application, working in collaboration with the city in terms of the comments. And then the last piece was really to take those three tasks and put together some actionable strategies that we think or we hope that uh, Longmont could look at in terms of potential changes or ways to enhance the process. Again, to really to strengthen the partnership between public and private because to build anything, whether it's in Longmont or in Loveland or in Denver or anywhere, you really need to have a strong sense of collaboration with the uh, your municipality. So for the abandoned projects assessment, so if you're, again, if you're a developer, you want to build anything, the first step you have to do is what's called a pre-application. So basically you submit, basically kind of a sketch plan and a description of what you want to do to the city, and this is called a pre-application. And then the city will, um, through the Planning Development Services Department, will get all the Public Works Department, fire, police, and other you know agents and you know, departments within the city to kind of review your application to kind of give you some very preliminary, high-level cons uh, comments about, hey, this works well. You should think of this. These are some issues. You need to be aware of this. And so a lot of times, if you're a developer or a property business owner, you'll submit that application, and then you'll go back and decide, okay, do I want to submit something? You know, do I not want to submit it or what? And so this was the metric that we used to kind of figure out who's submitting applications and are they being abandoned. So basically since 2019 through July of this year, there was 271 applications that were submitted to the city. Um, of that, we had to go through the process and figure out which ones are active applications, which ones were, you know, were completed since then, or maybe under construction or unknown. And so the city has what's called an active development law. Basically, once you submit a formal application after the pre-app, it goes through the development review process, and that's what we consider an active application, meaning it's currently being reviewed by the city. Um, if it's obviously been completed or under construction, that means it receives, it receives its approval. And so what we focus on means there's a lot of different site plan, there's a lot of different applications that have pre-apps. It can be a site plan, it can be a plat, it can be a change of use, it can be a temporary use, it can be a, a public improvement plan. So we really focus on site plans. Site plans are ones that actually you know, lead to building something. Of that, we were able to identify 33% um, of the applications were considered active. Um, and then through this, we identified about 8% of the projects were abandoned. And so to find out whether they're abandoned or not, really involved calling and talking to the applicants, whether the developer or the uh, site plan consultant to find out why they abandoned it. Through that, we, we um, identified, there's a lot of reasons why projects are abandoned. If you own the property, what we found is it's, you're not gonna really abandon a project. It may languish or sit there for years until you can kind of figure out what you wanna do. But if you're a developer and you have a property under contract and you go through a site plan application and you figure you can't build what you wanna build, then that, that, property, that developer may abandon the project. And so what we found out is about half the applications that were um, submitted were abandoned, that were abandoned were abandoned for entitlement related issues. Uh, financial issues were 20%. Site issues, the site was too small, the site didn't have the, didn't permit the right density was another reason. Market issues um, was also there and then other. So <clears throat> kind of key takeaways of this, you know, why were these projects abandoned? And so it's a lot of interesting information, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why projects were abandoned. When you look at entitlement issues, um, some of the things that popped up um, were off-site infrastructure requirements. A lot of times if you're a developer and you, you need to build, like say a multifamily development, you're gonna have to pay for off-site infrastructure to service that development. That cost can be very significant depending on where your building, your property is located relative to existing water and sewer mains, for example. Um, Rising construction costs, it really came out as another big issue that in terms of why projects were abandoned. Now, obviously because of COVID, you probably heard supply chain issues are this wreaking havoc on the construction industry in terms of getting rising costs of lumber, steel, copper, all those materials that go in to build things. Um, another issue that was identified is the length of time in the review process, and I'll get to this a little bit later, um, that the time it takes from when you submit an application to when you receive approval can really vary. It could be years to some extent, depending on the number of comments you receive from the city. Local and federal regulations. Sometimes if you're located in a floodplain, you have to get the federal government involved through a FEMA process, which can really add cost and time to a project. Um, in terms of market issues, you know, one of the things that we found, you know, industrial and multifamily are, are very much kind of plowed through the pandemic. It's really kind of a 
favorite asset class in terms of the investors today in terms of building things. Obviously, office and retail has been more dramatically impacted. And one project that was abandoned was a potential downtown office um, project because of the uncertainty of how the COVID pandemic would impact office in the long run in terms of leasing, in terms of rents, and in terms of the ability to lease up or absorb the space. Um, the next task is we looked at um, this what we call the comparative entitlement process. So as I mentioned, we looked at the Spokane Coffin, which is you know under construction right now by Boulder County Housing Authorities, 73 units of affordable rental housing with a parking garage and about 10,000 square feet of commercial space. The other project, if you've been down or up there, is called uh, Patina Flats at the Foundry. And this is a big redevelopment project in downtown Loveland that was a public private partnership as well. Um, that was completed by Brinkman Development um, recently. And this one actually was 155 units of market rate housing with a ground floor commercial space and a larger parking garage as part of the bigger foundry development because also it includes um, a new hotel, a uh, civic space, and a movie theater. So it's a larger, it's one of the biggest, well, it is the biggest redevelopment in downtown Loveland since um, a long time. <laughs> so in terms of key takeaways from the multifamily, the comparison to the Spokane Coffin, and the uh, Patina Flats. Um, both are public-private partnerships. For this, uh, the Patina Flats, that one received about 28 million in public financing in terms of um, infrastructure investment, the, the parking garage, and some development fee waivers. Similarly, obviously, with um, the Spokane Kaufman, it's a public-private partnership in, in the sense of you have, um, in, I guess, the Spokane, Kaufman, Spokane Kaufman's capital stack is about this long, I mean, in terms of like um, LIHTC, um, you know, low-income housing tax credits, you have some state tax credits, you have the DDA participating as part of the parking garage, and so both projects were really uh, public-private partnerships. One thing that was interesting with the, um, the, the Foundry project, it was identified as a high-priority project in the city. Um, and so the city, um, um, city manager, through um, their planning department, had a dedicated planning staff to shepherd that project through from beginning to end, and once Brinkman was selected as the developer, it, only, it took eight months, I just couldn't believe this, eight months from when they were selected to when they broke ground, which is an incredibly fast process when you, given the complexity of this $100 million development that involved multifamily, some commercial, a parking garage, a hotel. So I was pretty impressed in terms of how that project worked and how they got the, that thing through to approval. They did say, you know, and, and let me just say, in terms of this process, I interviewed both the developer and also the municipal staff from both the city of Loveland, the city of Longmont, and then Brinkman Development, and then actually Boulder County Housing Authority to kind of get both sides of the fence. Because I think it's important in, in terms of, you know, when, from projects that approved that you have an understanding of what the city may be thinking from the developer, but also what the government may be thinking from the municipality. And so in the report that I think was attached, you might, might have read some more detailed comments about that. I think. One thing that was interesting, and I kind of mentioned this um, more, is one of the things that really lengthens the entitlement process is the number of reviews that your application has to go through. Once you submit that initial submittal, the city will review it, provide comments, send it back to the developer applicant, you make changes, and you resubmit it. Well, it's not just two times. It can be six times or seven times. And so for the Spoken Kaufman, it was six reviews. <coughs> no, five reviews, six submittals. That took 15 months from when it was submitted to when it was approved. By comparison, um, the Loveland project only had three reviews, and it took, I don't know, it took eight months when they actually start construction, but when it could receive approval, it was probably like uh, four months or so. And that one also required planning commission, which is another step in the process, whereas Longmont's project was a site, was an administrative process, meaning it didn't have to go to planning commission, didn't have to go to city council. So even with the extra step at Loveland of, of going through on planning commission, it was still an expedited process. So four weeks versus 13, or four months, four months versus 13. Five to guess, yeah, he, he, didn't, he didn't remember exactly, but when you, car because after you get your site plan submitted and approved, next step is to get the building permit. And right. so a lot of times developers, if they want to take the risk, you'll parallel track it and do your construction plans. Building permits is a much easier process at the end because you just, you just, have, you just have to follow what the, um, but the International Building Code has for long months 2018 IDC code, pretty standard. It's just the site plan process is, is what's elongated. David, can you highlight or expand on what would cause multiple reviews? 
So, yes. <laughs> and I can get to that into the kind of recommendations too, if you don't mind, but there, a lot of times it's, um, it can be conflicting comments, it can be repeated comments, and it can be new comments that weren't introduced with the initial application. And so what, one of the things that's really critical, I think, in terms of the discussions and the, is really having standards that if you're an applicant, you know how to review something and, and you can design to a standard. If, you don't, if you're designing to a recommendation or a best practice, it makes it really hard to versus a design to a standard where you know exactly what you need to build. The other project we looked at was this industrial flex space. And so um, at Don Macy's pro project, there were 66, um, 1660 South Fordham, it's under construction. It's about a 97,000 square foot flex space. Um, the other one is 1875 South Taylor Avenue down at CTC in Louisville. It's about 83,000 uh, square feet um, by Silver Point Development. Interestingly, both projects are very similar in terms of the type of construction. Um, both have 24 foot clear height, which is really kind of modern flex space that can be adaptable on the inside. Um, they really address what we consider that um, last mile in terms of warehouse distribution and um, you know e -com the impact of e-commerce, which is really driven the demand for industrial space in Denver and in, in the nation. So with this project, you know, both, and I interviewed both the municipal staff and the, um, the developers um, and their consultant. It was a pretty straightforward process, you know, um, in terms of getting approvals. Um, the Longmont project was an administrative level, similar to Spoken Coffin. It was no planning commission or city council approval. Um, the Louisville one actually had to go to Planning Commission and City Council because they had to rezone the property, which is really kind of strange because it was already an industrial park, but because it was located along Highway 42, it had more commercial design standards versus industrial, so they had to rezone it to make it more industrial in terms of the type of construction they wanted to build. And um, um, the key to success, similar to uh, um, the, the, the multifamily, was really having a, a lead staff planner who provided clear direction and coordinated the, the municipal, run, municipal response in terms of the comments. I think one thing that we learned is um, through this is having a lead staff from a city planning that would coordinate any type of internal conflicts in terms of, sometimes you'll, you'll have public work that will have one comment and planning will have another and they conflict with each other. So if you're the applicant, you don't know how to respond. And so having that internal coordination where the applicant can, where, where the city can have one person who kind of coordinates the response back to the, to the applicant so they know how to respond really helps make it clear and transparent. So I guess overall, um, this kind of chart on the side here kind of shows the steps in the development process. You know, real estate development is a very complex and expensive process. Um, it involves a lot of um, with significant risk. You know, even before you decide to build something, you have to you know control the land. You have to do your due diligence. You have to see if there's a market for, say, an office building or a retail space or an industrial project. Um, once you decide there's a market for that, you have to do your application process. You have to get your approvals from for, from the city. You have to go find the money, do the financing, underwriting. You have to do your final design. You have to do your pre-construction planning and land, you know, purchase closing. Once that all is all done, you move on to actual construction, which involves putting in the site and infrastructure improvements, building uh, the building, you know, managing risk. Because the biggest thing about you know doing these things is you have a performer that has certain rents or certain um, cost per square foot of what you forecast, but you don't know until it's actually built and performing. And so there's a lot of risk up front for a developer that. If it doesn't perform as well as you expect it, it could be a challenge in terms of you know the um, um, in returns on your investment, which gets back to you know your equity partners. So, I guess what I would say is having more uncertainty in the process really increases the risk, which really increases the chance of a project not moving forward. So, to the extent that public and private partners can be transparent. And having a predictable process really cuts down on the time and makes it a lot easier for things to be built. And this is not just a long mile process pro, um, issue, it's throughout the nation. One of the things we've been hearing is just how challenging it is today to get things entitled and approved, particularly for residential and for commercial, and obviously for commercial. So the last piece was identifying kind of some tactical strategies 
um, for the various parties to consider. Can yes. I ask a quick question? Sorry. Sure. On the, the last project, uh, so, yeah. the industrial flex, what was what was the timing about the same or was it um, different between two projects? Um, yeah, it, it's actually pretty similar. Okay. I think, um, I have to go back, it's in the report. I think it was about seven months for the um, 1616 South Fordham. Um, the actual, um, and that was just administrative. The, the one at CTC is a two stepper. So it took five months to get a planning commission and city council approval, and then it took another six months okay. to get the thing. So if you carve it out, it's a very similar distance from the site plan. So again, these are ideas um, that you know, we think could be helpful in terms of you know, kind of improving the, the partnership between the public and private sector. I think you know, one of the things we talked about you know, is, is really looking at um, Ensuring there's adequate development review staffing capacity, which can really shorten timelines. You know, staff is great. You know, we, you know, that was one of the comments that you know from the interviews with various people. Staff is great. It's just the process that's challenging. So to the extent that we can make the process easier, more flexible, and more predictable, really can 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 help. I think staff, um, you know, move through the process easier. Um, that there's some issue. You know, some opportunities to update the land development code. To be better aligned with the Envision Longmont, one of the things that came out is what the people have commented is our code is very suburban in nature. So Longmont isn't a suburban community in the extent of when you look at what's left in land, it's going to be mostly in, in the in the form of infill and redevelopment opportunities. So aligning the land development code to um, provide for more urban infill development is um, one, one thing that's identified. For example. If you want to build, you know, in terms of easements for utilities, I think LPC has their own separate easement. So typically, if you want to put a water line and a sewer line with it with an electrical line, you can't do it. So because of that, you have to have a 40 foot or 50 foot easement width, which makes it more suburban in style versus if you can consolidate and have all your utilities in one easement, it, it, because the easement, those easements are usually where the roads are underneath. That really makes it a more urban fill um, form. Um, another one is. And this came out too, um, and I did talk to staff, and I think they're going to try to introduce that early next year. Is um, for our, the city's public improvement design standards go back to 2007. And so, one of the things is to really update that to 2021 to be compliant with state statute and also to address water quality and stormwater detention. A big thing that came out in the conversations is um, water quality and stormwater. Basically, before you discharge into the, into, um, the, it, the city's water system, you have to clean it up. And so there's no design standard to that in the current design standards. And so by bringing that, by adopting a 2021 design standard that addresses water quality and stormwater detention, it makes it so much more predictable for an applicant so they know how to design it versus a best practice where you're kind of like, well, do I, if, I design, if I spend time and money design it this way, the comment may be come back, oh, you need to do it this way. And this is back and forth that really increased costs and time. Other things to consider um, that um, that you know came up again. These are things that can save time. It can save money, and it, and it can do it both from the, the municipal side and also from the applicant side. It's really kind of combining because um, public improvement plans and site plan construction sets into one plan set. Right now, if you submit, you have to do two, but it's the same document, but you have to you have to, you have to produce them twice, so it costs twice as much. Um, really, again, look at increased opportunities for the LDBA and LEDP to be more integrated into the development review process, particularly for high priority projects that are identified. So the city, so your groups have a chance to comment on the process to help make it uh, more efficient. Another one that popped up, and, and I think the city is looking at this, is what we call it a, a high level conceptual review process. And so this is what um, the city of Loveland does. And so basically, before you submit your full application, I mean, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to submit a site plan application to the city because you have to do construction plans, you have to do stormwater plans, you have to do phase one environmentals, you have to do public improvement plans, you have to do site plans, photometric plans, lighting plans. I mean, it just it adds up. It's a tremendous cost, even before any of the projects are approved. So to the extent that you can meet with the city, come up with some ideas about where the city can provide initial feedback, in terms of what they like about it, what they don't like about it, before you, before you go to the process of fully submitting, you can help cut down on costs. 
other ideas is really kind of exploring what we call the formalization of a priority re priority review process for identified you know, high priority project, you know, public private partnership, for example, with a what I call a project development administrator with decision making authority. And that, that last piece is, is really critical. And so this person will be, will be part of municipal staff, but they would have the ability to kind of coordinate any internal conflict, say, between public works and planning to kind of get a application or comments back to the applicant to move the process along in an expedite in an expedite manner. Um, other one, again, I mentioned kind of ensure quality control measures, and this is both sides of the fence. I mean, we recognize that um, if you're an applicant and you get comments back and you're complaining that it takes so long, well, you need to turn your comments back to the city in a timely manner as well. And so one of the things in talking with municipal staff, they were very helpful in identifying things that popped up from there and that they wanted the applicant to know about to make it easier for them to review. Um, other ideas, um, consider setting up a separate development review process for smaller projects. This is something, I mean, right now, you just if you submit for like a site plan waiver, you get in the same queue as someone who's doing the smoke on pump thing. And so because of that, staff has to allocate the same time in terms of getting in that queue. So to the extent that maybe staff could be focused on maybe smaller, have dedicated staff to focus on smaller projects, get them out of the way so that it permits other staff to work on these bigger projects is one idea that was brought up. Um, and the last one I want to mention, so this is a good thing. Um, you know, the city several years ago moved to this e electronic document submittal process. You know, back in the day, you had to submit hard copies of everything, which again, is a big cost. Through the city's Accelo program, you know, the city has really identified, you know, these what we call e-submittals. But one of the things we heard, both from you know, municipal staff and from the applicants, it can, be, it can be challenging to navigate. If you've ever gone through it, it can, you, know, you have to put things in PDF and compress it, and, and, you know, and all the comments come back and forth on this, you know, back and forth, this e-submittal. So providing additional user guides or um, just more clarity on how to use the Acela um, electric, electronic document submittal process to be more user friendly, intuitive, and streamlined was one thing that was identified that could be an opportunity. Um, so this is my last slide. I just want to highlight something here. Um, so every year, um, Urban Land Institute, which is one of the preeminent real estate think tanks, think groups in the country, puts together their importance of issues in real estate for 2020-2022 and their emerging trend reports. You can kind of see here, the top is what's most important and the bottom is what is what's least important and this is an interview about 2000 real estate developers municipalities bankers um, consultants lenders and so forth involved in the development process as you can see here obviously construction seems to be the top three in terms of material costs labor costs and availability um, we look at number five state and local regulations and this is the entitlement process um, so to the certain extent that municipalities and developers can work in a more collaborative manner. I think it would benefit everyone in the sense that, I mean, the ultimate goal is to meet you know, demand, whether it's demand for new housing, it could be affordable housing, it could be attainable housing, it could be market rate housing. You know, we, one thing that we've heard is that there's just a chronic shortage of housing nationwide, and you can't build housing fast enough. Because of that, you see these incredible increases in prices, aside from the rising in construction costs, we just don't have enough housing here in America, in particular in Boulder County, just how difficult it is, you know, with land to find the right sites and to make it work. So, just wanted to kind of highlight that um, as an issue, kind of moving forward. So, with that, I'd be happy to answer Can any questions. Can you go questions. back to slide twelve, real quick? Yes. Um, just one thing that, well, twelve. Two that's more. That's more. Mm -hmm. Okay. The one thing that I just wanted to point out because I think it has a lot of relevance us is that last bullet on there about potential uh, municipal tactical development review teams and we had talked about trying to identify within city staff who really does understand redevelopment or the challenges of infill development and that type of thing and having a group that could be convened when we have some of these because it's very different right than suburban or greenfield or that type of thing so i did want to point that out because i think that's yep. a pretty important one that can benefit us mm -hmm. yeah. So how are these municipalities going about uh, staffing appropriately? 
during for the review process? Yeah, good question. Um, I didn't. That be It would be interesting to see, like, and I didn't do this, but like, um, if you take a city and you know, city of pop, say, say Louisville, population twenty thousand, they have three review plans. Lo uh, Loveland, city of seventy-five thousand, they've got eight planners, and so it's almost like a planner. It's almost like a development review planner per capita kind of deal. So I don't know. I mean, it depends on funding, you know, opportunities. I mean, how does Longmont's planning staff stack up relative to the sure. population compared to other cities? Well, the fact that they, you know, Loveland was able to get that review done within eight months yeah. for that size project. I mean, yeah. how many I, people were on that review? I think, from what I can tell, I think, I think, I think Loveland's got more development review staff yeah. for a city of less population than Longmont. I don't know what the pipe, development pipeline is like there. In terms, you know, if you look at the city's active development log, it's like 20 pages here in Longmont. I mean, there's just a ton of projects that are going through the process. And so that's why one of the recommendations, is, and this is you know, coming from the city staff too, is like, hey, you know, we need some help here because I think by increasing that capacity, we'll really address a lot of these sure, things. Because sure. again, it's, it's the people are great. It's just the process and the bottlenecks and, and the challenges can be really make it extended. <laughs> in the staffing, did you uh, notice any impact of having to use consultants, review consultants? Good question. Yes, yeah, so the city, they, they've since switched it. So one of, the things, um, one of the things the city did do is they would outsource certain parts of the review process. Landscape, for example. And so one of the recommendations was to bring landscape in-house and actually hire a registered landscape architect. Because you have re you have registered landscape architects that are preparing these site plan applications, but there's no registered landscape architect on the city staff to review those, and so they had to outsource it to a third party. But I think they've since brought that in house, and, and or the goal was to bring that in house too, because that can extend time on too. It, it can be more expensive, I, you know, in terms of the, the consulting costs that the, that the city has to pay for like a structural engineer, a third party structural engineer, or a third party landscape architect could be pretty expensive. Versus if you can have that staff in house to do that, would be much better. But well, you also want people that are familiar with the environment. Too. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's critical. Yeah. Well, I mean this is anecdotal, but our experience was the outside consultant didn't read the city staff's yeah. guidance memo. Sure. And just yeah. went straight to the code, and so we had to submit the yeah. the previously written city staff's yeah. guidance memo, which yeah. One of the nuances was, with the e submittal, <clears throat> and I've heard this several times, is they make a comment in the PDF. And they'll make because something's repeat on the pages. They'll have that same comment repeated like a hundred times. And so, as part of the applicant, you have to respond to every comment. So think about that. If you're the applicant, you know you're paying a consultant. You have to respond back, address, 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 address. So there's yeah, you know, there's ways I think to improve that process to like not make it every single comment if it's a repeated comment to make it more efficient because it costs money on both sides. It costs money from the municipal side in terms of. Having that staff person have to re review it, and they're not—they're in turn now reviewing something else where they can maybe move on, move on to another project. So, um, this assessment: What are your thoughts around the impact of our inclusionary zoning ordinance? And because I mean, it doesn't matter of size. So, what percentage of that eight percent are those smaller? Developments that were held up. Yeah, I didn't. There was only one project where I guess. It was abandoned because the city changed, or something that the AMI level changed, which yeah, impact, can, what's that? I can, you want me to? Oh yeah, by all means, please. Yeah. Uh, so there was a project that had um, started the process, um, and then midway through was told that they, so there's that mid-tier exception within the inclusionary housing ordinance. Midway through, they were told that it was impending that the mid-tier affordability price points were going to be changing and actually going to be made lower than um, what they were in 2018, which we all know that didn't happen. Um, and so, but um, that hasn't happened yet, but just the potential and the risk that that presented to the project is why they chose to abandon the project entirely. Um, I will say we um, there's another group that's convened um, specifically around um, uh, advocating for um, policies and processes that 
make feasible the development of attainable housing. Um, it's called Prosper Longmont, and um, one of the things that they'll be advocating for is um, a policy or program um, for the city to create a policy or program um, that focuses on workforce attainable housing above and beyond and outside of the inclusionary housing um, ordinance um, so that the two aren't mixed. We're just finding that there are a lot of rules that apply to affordable housing that don't necessarily apply to attainable housing. And um, so um, there are people that are looking at that. I'd be happy to share that information with you um, okay. if you're interested. Okay. Thank you. So a couple yeah. things. Um, you know, you talk about the lead staff and in the budget for next year is an ombudsman position through the city that hopefully will do this. I think the thing that is really important, and you mentioned it a few times, is not only does that person shuffle people through, but they have decision making or that someone has decision making. I am often in a meeting where they're talking about the options and at the end, I. I am not clear that there's a solution or sometimes they have to go back and get more information but then you're just never clear I have to say that, about what the actual solution is and some of us and yet yeah, this is it so I think that has been something that's been so frustrating and I know Jessica gets called and I get called and it's always that that there's just I just can't figure it out and sometimes you know I've been in meetings where they say yeah we'll just go back and show it to us and, and it, it was it's kind of like We'll know it when we see it, yeah. which is a hard, was hard. So um, I think that clarity and certainty is is really important. And you talk about adopting that 2021 yeah. um, standard because, especially for the infill, this happened at the spoke, right? Yeah. It wasn't adopted, so there wasn't anything you could point to. The infill, the storm drainage, there's, it's not easy. You can't have a big retention pond in the middle of downtown. You can't have so many. That, so that's a really good recommendation in there. Um, and you talked a little bit about the smaller projects, and as you all know, we deal with big projects and small projects down here. Um, the time it takes sometimes to get a pre-app is really long when you, and we heard that from folks when we were in David sessions. And so if you have something under contract, you kind of need to have that pre-app for these small folks before they buy it, it yeah. you know, the timing might be too hard. And, and I know Brian Schumacher has been fantastic at taking calls and trying to yes. answer people when they're in that, but... Um, so it's a staffing issue. If they're only doing two two a week, that's only eight a month. And for a city of 100,000, you may have, I don't know how many projects that are trying to do that. And if you if, if, you, have, if you want to do a pre-app and you're two months out, two and a half months out, I mean, that could impact uh, applicant or potential buyer's ability to say, hey, I want to move forward that. I can't even get in and figure out this is going to be something supported by the city or something like that. So we can get back to the staffing thing. And, you know, I mean, this report, I mean, it's going to be shared with, I think, the planning director and planning director. Some of our have seen it and Harold's seen it. You know, so, you know, hopefully it leads to some conversations and ideas about improving that kind of collaboration. Sorry, Phil. Oh, great. Um, I just, yes, I have to look at it. Uh, any other questions from the board for David? So what we're asking is uh, for the board to accept uh, this report and um, and consider the <coughs> recommendations and tactics um, moving forward. And then Jessica and I will be meeting with city staff to kind of get the ball rolling on, okay, let's go through which one of these things that is not going to help, but it would make sense. So moved. So moved. All right, motion moved by Joe. Do we have a second? Seconded by Gus. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. 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 Very much. Okay. Jessica, you do have a second. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Good one, Jill. Yes, thank you. I really had some arms around things that I think we all knew or experienced in some way, but but, but now it's quantifiable. It was fantastic. It was interesting. It was a big learning experience for me talking to both sides in public and private in Longmont, but also elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, next on to old business. So, developmental project update. Okay, just wanted to update you on uh, three things that we talked about um, before. 
the annexation, I know we had talked about the two properties. I have since had two other properties reach out um, uh, north of um, Long's Peak. And so both of them, we had great conversations. They seemed fairly interested. Uh, one of them had to go back and talk to their partners. Um, the other one was going back and talking to their tenant. However, their tenant called me excited to be involved in the DBA. And I said, yeah, we're not quite the DBA. So um, I'm thinking that those two will come through. When they do come through, I'd like to get a motion with the addresses to add them in, but I don't want to do it yet because I haven't gotten the final absolutely. But it seems um, that we'll be moving forward, forward which I think is fantastic. Um, I did talk to Don Bruchette, who's going to be the planner that helps usher this through. It has to go to both planning commission and city council. There's a number of steps. We have all of the documentation, um, the resolution, and the ordinances from the first annexation, which Jim Golden, by the way, I was told was done entirely by you and Jim Willett. Or Jim Willett. Yeah. Say what? The, the first annexation was done by you and one of the attorneys, Steve oh. Hart. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so my only questions I might ask you to remember um, that far back. But uh, I'm going to upgrade all those documents. I'm also going to reach out to our attorney just to make sure that he is looking through the statute of, of steps and that everything's um, moving forward. Uh, in all reality, that will um, probably go to council sometime in January is what we're thinking. And then it'll take through February for that Um, the lighting, thank you all um, on Hoffman Street for saying you did not want to pay for it because it went over well. <laughs> um, no, I said, you know, we're not quite sure that we're going to be able to add that lighting. When we add lighting, we just turn it over to you anyway. So they're looking to do a double cover light possibly on the um, street lights and then look to do some types of lighting. So we will let you uh, keep you updated on that. And then the Dickens patio, we did meet on site with the property owner who would like to keep the brick on the top. We did let him know that if he keeps the brick on the top, it is going to be his responsibility to maintain and service and do all of that um, in the future. We are taking out a strip of the brick to see if the concrete is compromised. Did you hear back from them? Is there a yeah. Okay, did they say? So yesterday the contractor went and started to look at it. So we will just continue to follow that and three things that I want to follow up on. All right. Any kind of questions for Kimberly? Seeing none. All right. Next we have financial update. Yeah, since we're a week early, we don't have the actual financials from Jim, but uh, Delray was able to go in and run them on our system, and uh, you know everything looks in line and it's both under. Uh, you'll see a lot of money coming out of the A and E um, for the next two months, which is all of our holiday events, all of our holiday supportive businesses. Um, I will say the staff; these guys have been crushing it. Have done a fantastic job. We've done some great things. We have some goodie bags over there. If you haven't seen them, that we'll be giving out. And uh, it's a really cute sticker giant. We donated some really cute Keep It Local labels that people can put on gifts that says the support of the local business. And uh, we work with a marketing company that's down here called Brand and Beat, who just did fantastic work kind of upgrading all of our materials. So um, everyone's done a really great job. Today. So thank you for that. All right. Sounds good. Um, Longmont Creative District update. Yeah, so as we talked, the Creative District is moving forward and then there were pieces of it that we needed to kind of shore up to be able to get our SDFE funding. And one of that is to adopt a non-discrimination statement. The non-discrimination statement had to be um, no less than what SCFD's own statement is. And I put that statement in uh, your board packet. I also put an alternative statement that gave it context. It felt like it just says we won't discriminate against anyone, but then it doesn't say why or how or anything. So the other statement I thought really helped. We did vet this through our creative district board this morning, and we made two changes. We added the word um, ethnicity in there as well, and then at the end of the second statement, 
we added the word community. So I will read this very long statement just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the Longmont Downtown Development Authority does not discriminate against any person or organization based on age, race, ethnicity, sex, color, creed, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, transgender status, gender identity, gender expression, ancestry, marital status, veteran status, military status, political service, affiliation, or disability. These activities include, but are not limited to, hiring and firing of staff, selection of volunteers, artists, and vendors, and provision of services. We are committed to providing an inclusive and welcoming environment for all members of our staff, stakeholders, volunteers, subcontractors, vendors, clients, and community. I know. <laughs> um, so that is the statement, and I would just don't see if anyone has any comments, concerns, changes. No comments? All right, so we're looking for an adoption. We adopt the statement as read by committee. All right, so motion by Kirsten, second by Joe. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Two other quick creative district updates. We are partnering with Art and Public Places to do window murals again, and, um, and private businesses are funding them. We are uh, funding a few on kind of abandoned buildings, but other than that, we'll have a murals down here and one on the museum so folks have been selected it was a fantastic um, cadre of entries so we're super excited and that'll be just something nice to do around here um, and then artist Sunday we added that into our small business weekend so we did tree lighting small business Saturday and then artist Sunday where we encourage people to buy local art and we'll do pop-ups inside of existing businesses so I think there'll be about 15, yeah. about 15 artists that are going to be popping up into other places. So we're excited about that. Um, and then Bricks Retail just had their uh, Marathon Fourth, which was so great. It was um, hopping. It was hopping. It was hopping. I was down here like not long after it started up, like maybe between 11 and 12, and we'll be back for that. Yeah. There were so many people. And it, they just appeared to be moving. To the other businesses that were open, like Snarky Teens got really busy when I went in there to and stuff. So yeah. it was awesome. Yeah, it was great. And so thanks, Colin, as well for helping them oh, so cool. get their uh, <laughs> get their start and their road closure. It was really great. And she said she'd love to do it like three or four times a year. Yeah. Um, It'd be good in the, in the next one. In the yeah. spring. Yeah. Sure. I think it's good for all the other businesses downtown because it makes awareness of like the donut shop is there and the other businesses of um, sporting goods. It's like you were getting to see a little bit of it. Yeah. So it's it's good, to, good to promote your business and yeah. use those little pop-ups. Yeah. Okay. Um, on to executive director report. Okay. A couple things I did outline in the board communication are um, holiday office schedule. Uh, we're closed Christmas Eve because that's the third holiday to Christmas Day. And then we'll be closed the 27th. We take that day because we're working tree lighting. So the 24th to the 27th of December will be closed. Closed again the 31st um, of December because that's the observed um, New Year's Day. I will say it's a very slow week, so we just kind of have to think that's fine. Um, and then on Wednesday the 24th, uh, we'd like to close the office at noon. Um, Lots of people are on vacation. You know, they'll just take some vacation time to close it at noon. Again, a pretty slow day, so I just wanted to make sure you're all aware and any comments or concerns. Um, parking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, parking, parking, parking. Um, I met with uh, Glenn, the planning director, and Joni and Phil. Uh, Greenwald. Phil and I would like to pull out all of the little pieces of parking that are in all of these plans and really outline here is the city's philosophy on parking. This is what the community said, this is what we're doing, and hopefully take that to council to have council say yes, absolutely, that is our philosophy on parking. It feels like if we have something that says this is what we've decided to do with parking and this is how we're going to do it, and we're hearing your concerns, we're going to do everything, but truly this is our guiding philosophy would help on a lot of different projects. So 
that's one thing that we'll be working on um, in, the, in the hopefully near term future to get that done. The other thing is our uh, license plate reader software that the parking enforcement uses um, is has been broken for quite a while and doesn't seem like it's an easy fix. They've done it in Canada, they've done all these things, and they need to invest into a new system. That new system would likely be funded out of the park department, which is a fund that, that we manage. So we are starting a conversation with everyone on um, Monday to really talk about what does that look like to make sure any investments, not only in the hardware, but in the software side, will be compatible with what Emily has seen with all the permits and that it's a little bit more seamless than it was. It was kind of a cobbled together type system from the get go. And so how do we, we're going to really invest in it. How do we really invest in it and make sure it works? So I just wanted to let you know that that would be coming back to you as well. Um, likely an expense that would have to come out of the parking process. So there's that. Um, shared the, the shared space arrangement. If you remember, we uh, signed a uh, shared space licensing agreement that our attorney. Uh, pulled up with Visit Longmont. It's time to update that uh, in December. And I talked, Chris and I talked to Joe, and I kind of figured out, a, um, measured all of the, the shared space and the space and that type of thing. Right now, they're paying fifteen hundred um, to get closer with that, and with some of the supplies that we share, it would be looking at moving that number up to about seventeen hundred dollars a month. Um, a couple other things we want to add into the shared space agreement is that we'll be billing other expenses as needed right now because they are on the city system when they need a computer or something we buy that but then just build them back because that's the way it has to work it has to come out of the city fund so uh we'll build them back so i just want to put something in there so if jared goes away people understand there's other billable expenses that will be coming back and then um uh, joe uh, was uh, saying it'd be great to put in a um, 90 days if we terminate the laws. So 90 days if they want to terminate or if we want to terminate. <coughs> Hopefully that they'll be adding an executive director next year. But I still think with hybrid work schedules and with all that type of thing, we have more than enough space to accommodate. So whether it's kind of sharing some offices or having a that kind of thing. As they grow, I think that we work together. And so Jared and I talked about also amending this shared licensing agreement to say that we will work together to try to make you know the organizations continue to, to, to fit together. Um, so what I'm hoping is that I can get a motion to say, you know, not to exceed seventeen hundred dollars for the shared space agreement, but that um, possibly Joe and I can just nail out the details and then get this to the visit. I knew that Kimberly and Joe handle it. All right, motion made by Kirsten, seconded by Wes. Uh, any discussion? All Can't in favor vote on that. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Absolutely. No problem. <laughs> Thank you for handling it. <laughs> and then the very last thing that I just wanted to add in is um, we're selling lots of gift cards and right now on our website if you want a gift card it's a, a dollar fee for the postage and that type of thing we'd like to raise that to 250 for postage and processing um, uh, just to make it uh, you know a little bit more to cover the cost I know sometimes we are having trouble with mailing and that kind of stuff, but it takes a lot to process it. So just wanted to see if you all were comfortable uh, for us increasing that fee from a dollar to 50 on the website. Are we comfortable? I don't think that's what we're saying. Sounds good. Check. Awesome. I don't think I need a motion. I just wanted to kind of do that as an FYI and make sure we were good. So that is all. Unless you have any questions for me from the report that I get from the staff and I'm sorry. No questions, Marcia? Right. Nope. Sounds good. Sorry, I missed the beginning of donuts. <laughs> <laughs> you can make up for lost time right in front of you. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Yes. <laughs> All right, um, on to item from staff. I just have a quick update. Go ahead. 
Uh, on the winter walkabout, I had a really good conversation with uh, Boulder County Public Health. Um, as a refresher, the indoor masking order if it does it stays in place. The letter of it says that uh, performers can remove their masks when they must be 12 feet from both the audience and any other non-household band member. And so I just talked to them to see about options. The, the only option that I could read was for the entire event to be vaccine verified, including all staff, volunteers, attendees, artists, etc. And so uh, through that discussion, she said, you know, you could you could have it be uh, where the artists are vaccine verified. And they can all be on stage unmasked, no problem, as long as there's 12 foot separation for the audience, the audience is masked. Um, and then further to that, if a certain venue wanted to be a fully vaccine verified venue, which we have a couple that are interested in participating, but either are or would like to be vaccine verified facilities, then they can be vaccine verified facilities, but some could be not vaccine verified. I think that's how we're going to move forward and provide some most flexibility and hopefully the least to the audience. <laughs> so, I just want to give you guys that update. Make sure that sounds good. Um, can I ask for a clarification? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, are all the venues going to be vaccine verified or are all venues going to be masked? I wasn't sure quite which. So, it'd be a mix. It'd be all the venues would be, all the artists would be vaccine verified. So they mm -hmm. all the yeah, that was clear. Yeah, some venues would be not fully vaccine verified. The artists would be unmasked, but they would be 12 feet away from a fully masked audience. Mm -hmm. And then some venues could be fully vaccine verified, where both audience and performers and everyone in the building is vaccine verified and is not required to wear masks. And so the definition of vaccine verified, is that like the symphony orchestra is doing it, where you have to show your card on the way in every time? Yeah. Exactly. So we would either check out at the door or give them a wristband and show them the vaccine mm -hmm. or something like that. And we would just make it very clear on the schedule, any music in this venue requires a vaccine. We'd let people know when they buy the ticket. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Colin. Yep. And then I was just going to say that all of the parking lot lights have been installed. So. Go drive around in the parking lots. <laughs> Go check them out. <laughs> we did have one little snafu on the 200 East lot. They put them in the wrong lot. So safety and justice just got the new list. <laughs> safety and justice got some free bright lights. Oh, you know, so they need much. some good safety there, right? So, you know, the electrician is like, we messed up. We will pay for the lights for your lot. So those will come. So that's the 200 East lot is the only one that doesn't. But that lighting in there actually wasn't too much compared to the, all the other ones. These have noticeably improved. I think they look great. Nice. But the time change means you know, the time change main street. You really know yeah, how good it looks. Yeah. It is. It's crazy. Yeah, that's our new holiday lighter elevation. So yeah. we got them to get every um, trunk wrapped. So they either strung power from above to connect to other power, which we've never done before. And they're well, they used to doing that. Yeah. 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 Emily, anything? <laughs> Sounds good. We're going to move into the next session. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah.